Hello. Um, before I get into the final uh, Tarantino uh, uh, film, if you hear any uh, noises like rain and all that, um, you know it is raining, so you know, it might be your thunder and such. So if you do, I just wanted to say that right at uh, right out of the way. That way, if you hear anything, it's it isn't something like what is that? Is it like thunder or something? And yes, um, just to let you know um, from the get go. Um, now for the last uh, video in my uh, journey through uh, Quentin Tarantino films. Of course, it's the last one I haven't even talked about yet so far. Um, and the film is, of course, Reservoir Dogs. I have a shirt, obviously, just for it, and um, I have uh, the 10th anniversary uh, special edition DVD, and the 15th anniversary DVD and Blu-ray, which is also this set, of course. Um, now, I really love this film. Um, it was, it's just the film that when I watch it and I watch all the films by Tarantino, I just love it. I love it from beginning to end. I love how this is a heist film, yet we never see the heist at the very beginning, you know, all having breakfast and talking, you know, what Light Convergence about the song and uh, about tipping and such and classic Quentin Tarantino dialogue and excellent acting. Um, you know, Harvey Keitel is uh, Mr. White, Tim Roth is Mr. Orange, Steve Buscemi is uh, Mr. Pink, Michael Madsen's Mr. Blonde, Quentin Tarantino is um, Mr. Brown and Eddie Bunker is <clears throat> Mr. Blue, whom isn't really seen a whole lot. He's like only in two scenes. Um, and uh, Chris Penn plays Eddie, uh, the son of Lawrence Tierney, who's Joe. Um, Joe is like this. Um, well, he's a very he's like a businessman, and it also you know charge of like uh, uh, creating crime or having crimes committed and sort of planning it sort of like he's like a sort of like a gangster of sorts you know that's the thing we are to you know obviously take away they don't say he's a gangster but from what we see in the film you know it's really what you can kind of uh, I guess uh, have allusions to um, the, the cast is incredible the writing and everything is just fantastic and how again aside from you know instead of seeing the actual heist you, you know it, it shows the aftermath it shows the aftermath and the first thing we see after the opening credits is Mr. Orange yelling and screaming because he's been shot in the gut and uh, Mr. White is driving him back to their hideout and you know they get there and he's consulting Mr. Orange trying to you know, get him to calm down um because you know you know it's like getting shot in the gut is not a fun feeling it's not fun at all um he says like uh, next to the kneecap it's like the most painful area anyone can get shot in and uh but you know he, should, he doesn't need to worry because, you know, it takes days to die from his wound. But, you know, he's bleeding profusely. And throughout the film, we see this big pool of blood, you know, all around him. And, um, you know, Tim Roth had to be, like, hosed down to in order to be uh, peeled off because they couldn't just grab him and 
absolutely just hard like pull them off the ground they had to put water on um, that way you can get them off of uh, the ground very easily or at least as easily as possible at that point um, and uh, Mr. Pink shows up and uh, he's the one who says like they're they were set up there's a rat and now they're trying to figure out what all specifically happened and um, Mr. White and Mr. Pink go into another room which Mr. Orange isn't too thrilled about that you know uh, he's not you know sold on it and uh, the, the two of them talk sort of like what happened like how it seems like you know it does make sense they are set up and how they go through the events of what led to the police showing up how you know uh, like there's a certain response time and how there's a certain window from like when the alarm is hit to the cops will show up unless of course a, there's a patrol car going by the place at that specific moment um, and how you know Things are going well, and all of a sudden, uh, alarm gets tripped, and um, uh, uh, police show up, and then Mr. Blonde starts shooting people. But Mr. Pink says, "No, that's not it at all. What, the, what happened was alarm gets tripped. Mr. Blonde starts shooting people, and then." That's when the police showed up. You know, that's how you know for a fact he was. They were all set up. Somebody is a rat, and from there, um, you know, it's just a sort of like a guess game. Who is who, who is the rat? Who is informant or whatever? And uh, we see Mr. Pink and how he got out. You know, and running from the cops and uh, with the. Uh, bag of uh, jewels that they were to get because he was the only one who actually got them he stored them someplace and then came back to the warehouse to uh, like make sure that the, the police weren't there um, and so we see that we see he, how he gets a car he gets hit by a car and then he breaks the window grabs the woman who's like only one of two women in the entire film you know and after that he you know Starts shooting at the cops, hitting one of them, gets in the car with the diamonds, and then he drives off. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Pink and Mr. Orange, or, or Mr. Uh, White, talking, and how they're like, you know, like, who's the rat? Could it be like Joe? Could it be maybe this, that? And maybe Mr. White's the rat. Well, Mr. Pink might be the rat. And then. Mr. Orange is right, and then Mr. White's like, no, he's not the rat. He, he took a bullet, so I saw him take a bullet, so he's not a rat. And then they go back out uh, a little later. Um, though, before that, we see Mr. White and how he sort of got involved in this with Joe, and they're talking, and from the conversations, you can tell the two of them have history. Um, and there's a reference to Alabama, who... Um, is in True Romance, a, a character in, in True Romance is named Alabama, and it's been speculated that that's sort of who he's relating to that, but, you know, maybe not, maybe so. Um, but, you know, you know, if you've seen the film, maybe some doubts on it as to uh, if this Alabama from True Romance would have worked with... Um, Mr. White, perhaps, you know, some doubts might be in mind, but then, again, don't completely know a whole lot about her in that film. But, yeah, then, then um, you know, the, Mr. Orange or is passed out. Mr. Pink and Mr. White are sort of talking about what to do with him and how uh, it comes out that uh, Mr. White told Mr. Orange's name, and now it was sort of like casual. And how also you know, like you know, it's, you know, also how he was like dying, and he's saying it's his fault that he's 
been shot and bleeding out and how he's freaking out and he's like trying to calm him and how you know you know he might maybe he should never have told him his name but he just couldn't in that moment so you know he doesn't care and then mr uh, white and mr pink keep arguing and then Mr. White uh, punches Mr. Pink and he's on the ground and kicking him and they're pointing guns at each other. Then Mr. Blonde is there and he's sort of like calm and collected drinking soda and then um, they get into it a bit with Mr. Blonde regarding as to what happened, like why did he shoot up all, uh, the place and um, causing everything to go on off the way that it did and having them to sort of uh, by a miracle get out uh, alive and um, like wondering who's you know who is uh, alive who's dead and like Mr. Brown is dead because Mr. Orange and Mr. White were with him and then we see uh, um, or talk about Mr. Blue we don't they don't know what happened to him he could be alive or dead uh, in custody or not and um, they uh, after a little bit uh, Mr. Blonde has them go out to his car because he's got something that they'll probably like and then uh, turns out he has a cop in his car in his trunk and uh, from there, we then see the whole Mr. Blonde story as to how he got involved. You know, and Mr. White's name is Larry, Larry Dimmick. Um, and then and, uh, Mr. Blonde's name is Vic Vega, who is the, the brother of Vincent Vega from Pulp Fiction, John Travolta's brother. And from there, we find out how there's some stuff about the interactions between Joe and Vic and also then Eddie comes in later into the picture and talking and how they're basically old friends and how they've um, you know how good they are and this and that and setting up uh, Vic with uh, Mr. Blonde with a job at the docks where uh because he's on parole, he needs to prove to his uh, parole officer Scagnetti, who was, which is also a name from a, a Natural Born Killers, which was originally written by Tarantino until Oliver Stone took it and then sort of like did what he did with it. Um, you know, there's a cop there named Scagnetti, and now you know have to prove he's able to hold out a job. Until he can do his own thing, and um, from there they're talking about uh, getting, you know, maybe involving um, Vic on their job uh, that they're gonna do with the diamonds and such. So comes back to then the present, um, at which point we then see uh, Eddie on the phone trying to get in contact with his dad where, you know, it, you know, things have gone uh, wrong, obviously, and he's trying to get a hold of him, and then all the while, the, the guy's uh, got the cop out, you know, he's handcuffed, you know, uh, behind his back, and from there, you know, they're just beating him up, and they tape him to a chair, and, uh, Eddie gets there eventually and just talking to them and how you know, he doesn't believe there's a setup and he hears about how everything went down how it was because of Mr. Blonde and um, Mr. White is obviously not happy with Mr. Blonde. He's he, he's angry at him. He doesn't like him. Um, but then it's to say that, you know, Mr. Pink and Mr. Uh, White will take uh, to the cars that they brought and drive them somewhere else uh, and Mr. and Eddie will follow them and they'll also get the diamonds and then come back all the while uh, Mr. Blonde is going to be watching over the cop and Mr. Orange who is 
you know, still passed out uh, from his wound. And um, uh, he's going to torture the cop because he finds it amusing. Um, turns on the radio, takes out a straight razor, which uh, and goes over to Mr. Orange to see his wound. And then uh, Stuck in the Middle with You comes on, and then this is probably the most controversial moment of the whole film. Obviously, I know I'm going over the overall plot, but you know, this film is so good, it's like I'm just trying to lay it all out so I can sort of maybe be able to pinpoint why I, what about this I really love, um, the sight of it being a heist film without seeing the heist. Um, you know, uh, he then goes up and starts a little dancing a little bit to the song, singing along with it, and then cuts the uh, cop's face a bit, and then he uh, cuts the ear off. However, then the camera turns, and uh, so we don't see it. Then he comes into frame, holding the ear, and then he's sort of like mocking and talking into it as if you could hear him, and yeah, he throws it on the ground, and then he leaves back to his uh, car, opens up the trunk, and um, gets a gasoline can, comes back inside as the song uh, comes to its end as he's throwing uh, gasoline on, uh, or put, yeah, putting gasoline on the cop, and then he's putting it on the ground, and he's begging not to be, you know, burnt alive, and he's doesn't know anything about them, and he's not going to say anything, and he, Mr. Uh, Blonde just doesn't really care. He lights up the, his uh, lighter and is about to drop it, and all of a sudden he gets shot uh, by Mr. Orange, who has woken up at some point. Um, we don't know how long he's been awake, but obviously awake long enough to see Mr. Uh, Blonde uh, pour gasoline on him, on the cop, and then is about to uh, light him on fire. And um, uh, Once Mr. Blonde is dead, he uh, looks at the cop and says, asks his name, and says his name is Marvin Ash, and then Mr. Orange says he's a, he's a cop. Marvin says he knows, and he's like, your name is Freddy something, he's like, Neumendike, or Freddy Neumendike, and how he's, um, basically lays it out as to, they have to wait until Joe Cabot shows up, because that's when the cops will, uh, go in and take him down, that was, like, the whole point, the point is when Joe shows up, you know, for the diamonds and everything, they're gonna, get out of there, but then the cops will be there, and it's you know, not gonna basically uh, everything should go smoothly from there, uh, at least hypothetically, then again Mr. Orange was never supposed to be shot and then we see Mr. Orange's story as to how he got involved and he goes in to a, you know, like a diner cafe where um, Holloway, a cop, is, you know, he's talking to, um, to him, and, you know, he's saying how he's in now, how he's gotten involved in uh, this, well, heist that's going to be pulled off, and how, you know, Eddie, after three days, calls him, picks him up, meets Joe and Mr. White at, a. bar, you know, and where he then goes and, like, tells the commode story, then we see how he's been, re you know, he's got this story, the commode story to tell and to recite and having to memorize, that way he can then tell it to them, that way it's like, this is like what happened, like, you know, I had, like, this drug deal, this, um, you know, I was selling weed with a girl who I was a friend with, and, you know, I'm gonna sell it and make some money off of it, and then from there, um, they're going to, you know, uh, just to show that he's, like, you know, one of them, like, he's a criminal, 
but from there he also uh, from that story you know he has to make it his own he goes and says how you know when he goes to the bathroom having to have the weed on him because you know she doesn't want to be this place alone she can't go with her brother her brother has been arrested and so they're waiting for this guy to arrive he has to go to the bathroom so he goes to the bathroom and um, there's a cops and a German Shepherd and that German Shepherd keeps barking at Mr. Orange and yeah, and there's this cool shot where it's just the camera's going around him and he's going and talking about all this and how, you know, like, there's a sort of well, like a pan, like a splash of water on him and how, and then, you know, you have to sort of like remain cool after that initial shock and surprise. He goes, uh, he goes to the bathroom all while this guy's, one of the cops is talking about, you know, how this guy, he was uh, pulled over and stuff and he's, reaching over for his the glove box and he's gonna he's like i'm gonna shoot you if you don't put your hands on the dashboard and like, oh i know yeah and he keeps moving his hand towards it and then uh he keeps saying i'm gonna tow you away if you don't put your hands on the dash and the girlfriend starts saying yelling to listen to the cop then he snaps up and puts his hands on the dashboard and then he's like what was you reaching for oh it was registration and um, yeah, all the while, you know, Mr. Orange is going and washing his hands, and then he goes and uh, puts a, or turns the uh, hand dryer on, and then the, and it has this shot of all the cops kind of like looking at him, and then the dog barking, and then he leaves, and how, you know. And that's just a really cool scene. Um, you know, uh, from there, you know, we hear Mr. Orange talk a bit more about um, some of the guys there that he saw and met. Hell, you know, Joe Cabot's kind of a funny guy. He's got a cool guy, you know. Larry, uh, Larry, Larry Dimmick, which we don't know his last name until, like, if you watch the deleted scenes, um, you'll know about him and how he, uh, a little more about his crimes and such. Um, and basically, he, uh, Mr. Dimmick, you know, you know, he has a quite a rap sheet himself. Um, and we see him and Mr. White and him sort of bond, you know, a bit more than he does with the others. Um, then anyway, we go to see uh, Mr. White, uh, Mr. Orange's apartment while Eddie is down with Mr. Pink and Mr. White and he goes to, has a couple of guns on him and cigarettes and puts on a wedding ring, you know. Now, we don't know if he was actually married or not or if that was just sort of part of his, you know, his character. He's like married, basically. And, um, He has to say he's cool. Uh, they don't. They don't know anything. He's fine. And basically, from there, um, he goes down and gets into the car. At which point, we see a car behind. How you know these guys are? Uh, these cops are you know tailing them to see probably like where they're going. Uh, and, um, and they're on their way to the warehouse. All the while, um. They're all in the car. They're all talking about stuff like, you know, like Chrissy Love and uh, uh, just random, random st just random stuff that they're all talking about. Like how there's this girl that everybody, you know, oh, she's so like, beautiful and everything. It's just incredible and how just a, a tale of how uh, she glued her like husband's penis to his stomach because he was just a complete jerk and it's just just stories and stuff like that it's just real got casual dialogue which of course Tarantino is uh, known for and we see how uh, they then get their they're at the warehouse and Joe's kind of yelling at them like oh I'll just kind of getting all like squirrel girls and this and that like yeah we gotta like do this job right and you know you can't be doing it right if you're all 
acting like that. And uh, he then gives them their names, you know, Mr. Brown, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, and Mr. Pink. You know, Mr. Pink isn't too happy with that. He's good, what? Like, he doesn't want to be Mr. Pink, and Mr. Brown kind of, well, it's like, you know, my name isn't all that great either, you know, like, yeah, well, yeah, Mr. Pink kind of sucks, I'll be like Mr. Purple, and it's like, no, if you're Mr. Pink, some guy on some other job is Mr. Purple, and, uh, you know, everybody, you know, it's just kind of funny how that, that kind of, uh, becomes like a big thing, sort of, for a little moment. Then we see Mr. White and Mr. Orange, you know, at the place that they're going to steal the jewels from, or the diamonds. Uh, going over the plan as to who's going to do what. Mr. Brown will be in the car. Mr. Orange will be outside, and, you know, and just how everything should go to plan. And and then after this, they then we cut to Mr. Brown, um, slamming the car into some other parked car and uh, he has a bolt he's been shot in the head he's bleeding and uh mr white gets out of the car getting his guns drawn and uh waiting for the cops to come or following them and mr orange is there just sort of like trying to i, I guess keep calm mr brown saying he goes like oh and mr brown's like oh, i'm I'm blind. I said, no, you're not blind. You just got blood in your eyes. And then Mr. Uh, White unloads his gun uh, to the two cops in the car. Afterwards, he then goes over to Mr. Orange, who's looked on in horror at just what happened. You know, obviously he's a cop, so he's not too happy with that. But he can't really say anything. And then from there, uh, we see Mr. Brown is dead, and then the two of them walk uh, uh, towards an alley where there's another car coming and they hold it at gunpoint and then as Mr. Orange goes to the driver's side the woman in the car who is Tim Roth's dialogue coach and he uh, actually had her be in the that part because she was incredibly tough on him to get his American accent down um, I know some people criticize uh, Tim Roth's accent, like it doesn't sound American or it doesn't sound like that. I've watched this so many times, and well, he doesn't sound English at all, and he's English, so I he did a good enough job. Um, he does sound really American. Now, maybe he's not from L.A. naturally or originally. Maybe he uh, moved there, maybe transfer, who knows, but he's a... Uh, been a cop for quite some time and he's undercover here and um you know he uh opens the door and then the woman in the car shoots him and then he shoots her and that was kind of why he wanted her to play that part because again she was so hard on him he's like how about her how about she plays this part and all right it was agreed and yeah, it goes like she shoots me and i get to shoot her and that was well, fun <laughs> And then that's the story of how he got shot, and then you see him in the back of a car, that sort of reenactment that happens again for a bit. And we cut back to the warehouse. Uh, the guys come back uh, after getting the jewels, and then Mr. Eddie is not happy, the fact that Mr. Blonde is dead. And then he uh, tells that, you know, he, you know cut the cop's ear off and was going to burn him alive. And then he later adds, as he's retelling it, you know, oh, well, this cop, and Eddie shoots uh, Marvin, at which point, you know, it's like, you know, you could have just asked him, you didn't have to just shoot him. And he has him tell it again, like, you know, how, you know, Mr. Blonde, you know, is going to burn the cop alive, and he was going to kill Mr. Orange and wait, and then he's going to kill uh, all of them when they got back, and then run off with the diamonds. Which, of course, wasn't something that obviously happened, nor did he initially say. And, you know, Eddie retells it, and then he says how that doesn't make sense, because this man could have walked. He did time in, like, in prison for a while, and he could have gotten off by just saying his dad's name, but he didn't. And how all this doesn't make sense. Like, he got off, we helped him out, and then does his job, and he's going to just, like, you know, 
just screw them over and kill them. None of that makes sense. And then Joe shows up saying how, uh, you know, he says, like, you know, Mr. Orange is working with the LAPD. You tipped off the cops, and that's why everything that happened happened. And Mr. Orange, of course, is denying it. And Mr. Uh, uh, White doesn't, you know, believe this because the two of them have bonded quite a bit. And how uh, Joe's like, you know, I've got instinct and all this, and now I should. He was the only guy of them that he hired that to, for the job that he didn't wasn't a hundred percent on. And you know he's pointing a gun at Mr. Orange. Mr. White points his gun at Joe, and then Eddie points his gun at Mr. White. And there's a Mexican standoff, and they're sort of trying to like you know, you know, shoot him. You die next. And now like oh, let's all calm down. Put our guns down. Let's all just sort of calm down and everything. And Mr. Pink isn't involved, but he's like you know we're all supposed to be professionals. It's all just calm down and stop and then um, after a, a little bit uh, Joe shoots Mr. Orange uh, Mr. White shoots Joe Eddie shoots Mr. White and then Mr. White shoots Eddie however it happened so fast and that some people say oh who shot Eddie um, because you know you do see Mr. White point his gun towards Eddie but the squib went off early so uh, yeah, he didn't have enough time to shoot him properly, so he had to quickly just turn his wrist towards him, and that's how um, that happened. And there's this whole debate of, yeah, you know, who shot? Nice guy, Eddie. But, you know, that's really the story of what happened. Um, and then Mr. Pink gets all the diamonds and runs out and tries to get away from the car. Oh, the while uh, Mr. White goes over to Mr. Orange, who's, of course, been shot again, and he's bleeding even more. And now he's like, you know, we're going to have to do some time. And and the cops arrive, and Mr. Pink isn't able to get out, and you hear how, you know, he gets arrested. You know, they're telling him, get out of the car, and he gets out, and he goes, like, don't, sh like, don't shoot, I've been shot. And, you know, you don't hear a gunshot, so it's like, I think he's just saying that, so that way they won't shoot him. Like, I've already been shot, you know, don't... don't shoot me because that's the thing like people are like oh he got shot well you don't hear any gunshots you hear cars coming in and crashing into like some like maybe like some uh, garbage cans but that's really yeah there's no gunshot sounds outside and while that's going on um mr orange uh tells uh mr white he's a cop and uh mr white is obviously very distressed with this and he just can't believe it and then he points his gun at his head and the cops come in and then they're telling him to put the gun down and they're also they're going to blow him away Mr. White shoots Mr. Orange and then Mr. White gets shot by the police and dies and the only one who lives is uh, Mr. Pink um, that's what happens obviously in the film but it's just a series of events that, like, you know, this plan, you know, should have gone well if you were really to look at it, and yet things went wrong. You know, one's a cop, and he, you know, sort of forms a bond with this guy, you know, and he feels guilty, and for me, like, that's why he, obviously, you know, that's why he tells him at the end of the uh, film why, like, he's a cop. You know, he probably knows he's going to die, but he... You know, they became very good friends, and he just can't, uh, you know, and if he's going to die, he doesn't want uh, this guy who got shot because of him, in defense of him, he doesn't want to be like, you know, like, this is, I, I'm a cop, I am a cop, you know, and I'm sorry. He just doesn't want that to be, like, sort of like a continuing to be a lie he doesn't want Mr. White to not know at the end and of course that does cost him his life but he probably knew he was gonna die um but uh Mr. Pink gets away and of course I think people know Quentin Tarantino intended to um play Mr. Pink himself you know auditioned for Mr. Pink and Mr. Blonde uh 
Michael Madsen auditioned to be Mr. Blonde, or or Mr. Pink. Um, Harvey Keitel was the guy that they kind of he always kind of wanted to be Mr. White, and you know, by uh, like a miracle, you know, the script of Reservoir Dogs landed in the uh, hands of like a acting teacher of Lawrence Bender's who um, knew Harvey Keitel and gave it to him, and uh, from there. He got involved and also was a co-producer. And when uh, Tim Roth got involved and they were talking to him about uh, being in the film, he was offered Mr. Blonde or Mr. Pink. And um, at first he wasn't going to read for him because he's like, you know, I, I, you know, I've read. Uh, he, he's done a lot of readings and he's like, I'm terrible, but I've done enough movies now. People can look at those if they like what I've done. They can hire me if they don't. Alrighty, thank you. Uh, but he's not going to read. But he got drunk <laughs> being with Quentin Tarantino, hanging out with him and Harvey Keitel. But, you know, and then Harvey left at some point. But then they got more alcohol and went back to, to Rob's place and read all the parts and stuff. And, uh, that was it because he got so drunk he said I'll read anything for you um, and then there was like some interview where Tim Roth's like you know uh, actually he might have actually been faking being drunk too so it could have been all this elaborate plan to get me drunks enough to where I will read for him and uh, again he was offered Mr. Blonde Mr. Pink but he decided Mr. Orange because he said that was real, like a real acting job because this guy who was like a First, he's a criminal, but then it turns out he's a cop. But he gets so into that world, he is so friendly with Mr. White that he kind of seems to be a bit lost a bit. And then, of course, when he shoots the woman, you know, it's sort of like a defense mechanism. You know, he's a cop, so he's get shot at or he gets shot. You know, he's gonna natural reaction to that will be shoots back. But then he realizes what he's done, and you see immediate regret on his face. And then. Uh, he uh, also mentions how there's, you know, she had a baby, you know, and that's even more devastating, you know, and makes him feel even worse. Uh, but yeah, this just whole, you know, in the in many ways, this film is very simple. Yeah, of course, it's, it's we don't see the heist, but then it sort of like goes back and forth between like the present and the past, and then it, the very Quentin Tarantino esque which we then would see later in Pulp Fiction, of course. Um, but in that film, it was, I guess, maybe a bit more refined or so. But this film is just, I think, very raw. It's a raw film to the point where this is, real, like, his real first film. And I know he's made another movie before, but, you know, that... You know, I, like... like he lost interest, and so the entire film never finished. Not everything was shot. Um, it would exist now that you can find online is basically the person's like compilation and from beginning to like the end of like what was shot of, uh, of basically like a reel of their work. Like I think the cameraman had this film and put all this stuff together to make like a real like well this is like what I did and of course this is early but this is what I did and but we we're able to see his oh original intended like the first film which Tarantino was also like the lead of or at least the co-lead and um yeah it's this is an excellent film and I do have all these additions mainly because you know the 15th anniversary DVD has some stuff that, of course, this doesn't, but this also has features that this doesn't have, which is unfortunate, I think. Uh, there's these interviews with Quentin Tarantino, Lawrence Bender, Tim Roth, Chris Penn, Michael Madsen, Eddie Bunker, Kirk Baltz, and some others. But then there are some things like, you know, a tribute to Lawrence Tierney and Eddie Bunker, which is on here, and Reservoir Dogs director tribute in class of 1980. Uh, 
and some other things, and then there's other things here that are not, not here, of course, I did. You know, it's like 15th anniversary and the uh, 10th. Though the Blu-ray, unfortunately, doesn't have as many special features. It does have, like, the DVD of uh, the Pulp Factoids, which is an insider information about Reservoir Dogs and its various inspirations, playing at loose, Fast and Loose documentary, and uh, profiling featurette, and uh, deleted scenes. But the DVD has more special features, so that's why I have the DVD still. Um, there's also a 15th anniversary version of this with like a gas can. That's like a gas can, which then you take the thing off here and then you able to get to the discs that way um, um, now I had not I did not know about this at that point at the point when I got this but I have seen it uh, recently and it isn't a horrible price that people are selling it for like you know it's um, pretty good pricing Especially since that was like a limited thing, you know. After a while, they stopped making that, and then once it's gone, it's gone. And um, in very good condition, sometimes brand new, but it's, you know, really cool um, to see that the fact that, you know, this other version that exists of Reservoir Dogs, um, uh, you can find it at a decent price. And. I think that um, this film should have been nominated for various awards, like big awards, like Academy Awards and such, but because Miramax was going to do the um, theatrical stuff, like the theatrical, they had theatrical rights to it, uh, live entertainment, got uh, then later artists and entertainment, but you know, it says live entertainment in the beginning um, you know they had the home distribution rights and Miramax got the theatrical rights and so because of that I, apparently it they decided not to promote it for any like Academy Awards Golden Globes and BAFTAs and all that stuff just because of all that like, you know they're not gonna really get any much much more money out of it um, and the film wasn't promoted as much in America compared to like Europe, and as a result of that, um, uh, this film was was not a huge success uh, theatrically um, here in America, but other places it was it did was a better success. But it became a huge hit on video when it came out on VHS, and of course now DVD and Blu-ray is even a bigger hit. Um, I think if this was to receive any Academy Award nominations and wins, I would say original screenplay for Quentin Tarantino, even though he has a lot of homages to this film, in this film, obviously. But, you know, it's it's a it's a very good film you know, overall, and a lot of great elements and uh, conversations and such. Just excellent film. And I think also... Best supporting actor for uh, Tim Roth. Um, I know a lot of people like to point out like Steve Buscemi or Michael Madsen, and they're all, they're excellent. Everybody is excellent in this film. Um, and there is a deleted scene with the cop, as I mentioned, like with you see here Lawrence or Larry Dimmick's name, which you know Dimmick is also the name of uh, Jimmy, played by Pulp uh, in Pulp Fiction, played by Tarantino, you know, Jimmy Dimmick. Um, his rap sheet and there's a woman female officer who got cut and people are like you know her line delivery wasn't very good you know she wasn't a very good actress um, but you know something he do, Tarantino does is when somebody he thinks is bad um, he has them eat food which kind of helps because they're they have to try to talk as natural as possible like say their lines as natural with food in their mouth and so that's the other woman that was in the film at one point, but then got cut. And um, uh, a 
apparently the uh, commode story and all that stuff wasn't at one point really necessarily to be seen like the whole bathroom sequence it wasn't in the original draft but it, be, it caught into it later um, but again yeah I mentioned the supporting actor for Tim Roth his his performance was truly excellent. I think he did an incredible job from beginning to end. And I think in a way, it could be possibly argued he's like the co-lead of the film with uh, Harvey Keitel because like the last third really does sort of like center around him compared to the other two thirds of the film. And so, you know, you see a lot about him and his performance is excellent. Um, yeah, I think him being up for supporting actor and possibly winning, though, of course, that was the year Gene Hackman won for Unforgiven, but, and he was great in that film, and there's others that were nominated, but I don't know, I think Tim Roth would have been an excellent nominee uh, if, if he got to be up in the film, or in, in award shows and stuff, like Academy Awards and all that. Gave an excellent performance from beginning to end. Um, truly was great, you know. You know, see how he goes from being like a cop who really wants nothing to, but to like get, get these guys, you know, especially Joe Cabot. But and then as the film goes on, we see he's you know, sort of more wrapped into that world and how he and Mister White become friends and stuff like that. You know, I just love that. I love that about this film and like the rawness of this movie that you know that you can't really get outside of really like a first time uh, director's uh, work cause, and as time goes on it's sort of more refined um, now I don't always love like for favorite movies of certain directors that's not always the case for me I don't always love their first movie the best but sometimes it happens and it's not to say like the other movies they've made aren't good uh, at all um, I love, again, I enjoy and love all the films that Tarantino has made. But this one in particular is like the one that I just love the most. The story is excellent. Might be simple, yet done in a Tarantino way. Heist film, without ever seeing the heist, see the aftermath, and also a little bit before the heist happens, and just everything you get to know a bit about certain characters and how they relate to others and um, how they got involved in all this and it's just excellent to see from beginning to end um, I do wish it got acknowledged for many more awards and even was a bigger a bigger better success at the box office but you know as time has gone on this is a cult film Empire Magazine actually listed it as the greatest independent film that's been made. You know, of course, that's a very subjective thing, but I think in a way it would des be uh, deserving of that title. Um, it's definitely one of the best indie films ever made. Um, made a big landmark. Paved this, along with Pulp Fiction, paved the way for various filmmakers later on. Um, and, uh, yeah... Reservoir Dogs is an excellent movie from beginning to end. Um, I just love it. Uh, uh, characters and everything, it's just excellent from beginning to end. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of talking in circles now, but um, I hope this film uh, gets another release like a blu-ray release and such like you know now that there's 4k blu-ray maybe they'll be able to get it on 4k at some point you know Lionsgate Lionsgate distributes the film now but um the Criterion Collection actually released uh, the uh, laser disc of the film uh, when, it, when it came out first on the laser disc so maybe some point you know maybe this year for its 30th anniversary we'll get a 30th Criterion Collection anniversary set of uh, within 4K, which would be really cool. Um, but, 
you know, we'll have to see if anything like that happens later in the year. Um, it would be great, I think. Uh, and hopefully all the special features that have been included on these uh, uh, sets and editions and stuff like will be on that 4K set. If that ever does happen this year, hopefully it would, regardless if it's Criterion or not. It's just like, you know, I would love to have every special feature that has ever been released in all uh, of Reservoir Dogs DVD release and this Blu-ray. Um, and, uh, you know, any more new stuff uh, to uh, uh, happen and be part of a 4K 30th anniversary 4K Blu-ray uh, like special edition. I think that would be great. Um, but yes, this is a, that's that is the overall uh, my overall thoughts on Reservoir Dogs and the conclusion to uh, you know this whole Quentin Tarantino like marathon that I've done. It's it, this was a really a uh, fun set of videos to make. Um, I really love these uh, movies, and you know I could talk along a lot more about this film as well as all of them. But you know I don't want to just keep rambling on and on. But uh, yeah, that is my list. That is my preferred uh, favorite. This is my favorite Tarantino film ever made. Um, my fifth film of all time, and I, I just love it. I love it from beginning to end. Um, so what do you think? Uh, what do you think about this film? Do you love it? Do you dislike it? Do you rank it high on the, when ranking all of Tarantino's films, or do you rank it lower? Or is it somewhere in the middle for you? Um, you can let me know, and uh, we'll, uh, we can have a bit of a conversation about all that, but yeah, even though I've ranked some low, I still love them. And again, one day I may discuss True Romance, um, Natural Born Killers, The Four Rooms, films that Tarantino has written, as well as what Four Rooms wrote and directed the final segment of that movie. But the entire movie is not uh, his, um, obviously. But you know, and it's also I wanted to point out just one last thing before I go. You actually get to hear on the radio after Mr. Orange shoots and kills Mr. Blonde, uh, some of Jack Rabbit Slims and um, $5 Shake. So before that ever existed in Pulp Fiction, Jack Rabbit Slims and $5 Shakes existed in the, the Tarantino universe. But they we first saw it properly in Pulp Fiction. Um, I just remembered that and I wanted to just say it to, uh, just before I forgot, you know, and you do have to increase the volume to hear it. Um, so, yeah. And it's, a, again, it's after he shoots him, so there's no gunfire or anything. You can just listen real carefully and you can hear it. I remember hearing that some years ago, and I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Uh, but, yep. That is all I really have uh, to say now. Again, this was real fun, and um, if I ever do any more like series of videos, like franchises and such, or something like this entire director's filmography, I'll probably do it like this, where it's throughout the whole month, uh, like every other day or so. Uh, that's when the videos will come out. Um, so uh, that is all I have for now. Hope all of you uh, had a great weekend and. Uh, Having a, have a great day, and I hope all of you will have a great week and a great upcoming weekend. And I will see you all next time. Take care. Bye.